I, my career is on LinkedIn. Everybody has LinkedIn. You can go and you can read about it if you care to. I've been in the industry since Photoshop 4. You can do the math. Um, and, <laughs> and, and through that career, um, I landed, very, very fortunately landed at ADT um, at a super exciting time as the director of digital customer experience. And I'm going to focus on the year 2016 because that's the year ADT was acquired. I started with ADT before that, but I'm just going to use 2016 as, as the place that I'm going to talk from. So in 2016, ADT reported about almost a billion dollars in revenue. Um, we had our stock, stock was trading at about $25 a share. We had 6 million customers. So things, things were pretty good. They were going along well. Stock was kind of flat, but, but we're doing OK. We also had one of that 6 million customers, about 1.5 million of them were Pulse customers. And if you're not familiar, Pulse is like ADT's Internet of Things. It's the smart home offering. So we were doing some cool stuff. We had just put the, the first biometric secured and controlled mobile app into the marketplace to control people's homes um, with their, their Pulse systems. Um, we were grappling with the problems of interoperability in the Internet of Things. We were, built, we were working on new products. We're kind of doing, it, I mean, we weren't Amazon, but we weren't chiseling gravestones either. I mean, it was, it was good. So does anyone want to guess, right about this time, everything's kind of going along, how many customers we were losing a year? 30%. Thankfully, no. <laughs> it's a good guess, though, because an average number is around, a good number is somewhere between, what, 10 and 20%? So more than that would have been really bad. But we were, we were right around 17%, which was about a million customers a year. And we always stayed around 6 million customers because we would just go and buy more customers. Um, and so, why? Well, being in a relationship with us was horrible. And this was because of how the market had evolved. It used to be that you would go in, you would install a security system in a home, and you would just walk away. Everything was hardwired, it was pretty basic, windows, doors, blah, 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 wasn't hard. And what this had done was create a culture of just sign the contract, and we'll walk away, and for three years, we won't hear from you at all. But the Internet of Things changed that, right? It was hard. Things went out, things went wireless, your batteries went dead, you're calling us, the stuff is beeping, oh my God, things in the house are beeping, our, our agents on the phone are going, lady, it's your alarm clock, right? So people were just, it, it got harder, and we had to pay attention, but that wasn't our culture. Our culture was sign the contract, and we were just minting money, right? We didn't want to, when I first started at ADT, I wanted to email people. I wanted to proactively touch people. I wanted to give people the ability to change their payment date or cancel their payment, right? What, what good is it to me to try to take money you don't have, right? What? You want to do what? That's crazy. We don't talk, we don't talk to our customers, right? That was the culture that we had, we had, we had developed over 140 years. So in 2016, these are some of the numbers that we reported. With these numbers was all of the usual stuff, EBITDA, SAC, blah, blah, blah. But I love reading down into, oh, that's weird, right? I like reading down into the financial reports because down there below the line is all the stuff that tells you what companies are really thinking about. These were the numbers. 83% of our customers are on auto pay. Why is that good? Why do, why do we care? Well, because that way they just pay us. And we did all this work to figure that out if you're on auto pay, well, of that billion in revenue, most of it was subscription. That's the good kind of revenue. But not only am I going to get that revenue, but now I don't have to touch you. You would get on auto pay and we would cut off your paper statements. Congratulations, you're paperless now too. That way you forget me, right? 57% of our new ads were Pulse. Pulse customers are stickier because they like looking at the cameras and Pulse customers pay more money. So that's what we reported. 3.2 reduction in creation multiples. You know, some of you know what that is. It's the money that I'm spending to, to, keep, to, to obtain my customers, but it's also the money that I'm spending to keep them. We were proud of that. Like, I'm spending less money on my customers, <laughs> right? So that's where we were. <coughs> Edward Schein, Edgar Schein, sorry, MIT. He's either retired or he's not there anymore, short of calling the man. I could not get a good resource. He taught at MIT. He has this wonderful graphic, which I'm not showing here because I really wanted to focus on this quote. But it talks about how our assumptions, it's an upside down triangle. Our assumptions drive our values, which then drives the artifacts of what we do. 
and he's an expert on, on organizational culture. And he says that a pattern of shared basic assumptions is learned by a group, and then it's given the value, the emphasis, to teach to the new people. So when I came to ADT, the people thought we were crazy. Like, why, why are you talking about talking to customers? So that's where we were as an organization. If anyone doubts what culture can do to, to, to mess up your plans, there, does anyone know about the Sprint Nextel merger? This is great. It's like four, everybody, I did some research, like everywhere you look, Forbes, New York Times, Investopedia, everybody talks about. Spent 35, 35 billion on, was it 35, 35 billion on this acquisition, and then three years later, 30 billion of that was written off as a loss. And the CEO of Sprint basically said it was culture. Nextel wore jeans, Sprint wore suits. Nextel was very entrepreneurial. Sprint was very hierarchical. Different expectations of IT and marketing, everything, right? Two cultures. They didn't even move into the same building, right? Culture can totally torpedo. And I don't know, I know you guys roll bigger in here in Seattle, but my last project was way less than that, right? I, <laughs> and I have three years to fail. So we had to come up with a way to get to, we couldn't change the whole culture, right? So we're, before I go any further, we're going to take a minute and give you guys about five, can they have five minutes? <laughs> um, give you guys about five minutes to sort of, you, I know a lot of you have already met, but if you could talk at your tables and just kind of talk about where are you at with your culture? What's going on in your organizations that is keeping you from delivering great experience design? And then also meet the other awesome leaders at your table if you haven't already. And I know it's dangerous giving a room like this, a room full of people like this five minutes, but five minutes. <laughs> So does anyone want to share what you guys, what you came up with? My name is Marjorie Hastings. I'm with Pemco Insurance. And I was talking with my new friend, Kevin, from Comcast. <laughs> and while we have different industries, um, we did determine that we we're really looking at how to um, pull into the culture the fact that customer-facing employees are not the only employees who are responsible for the customer experience, and that the people who are developing the IT that support those customer-facing are just as responsible for that service and need to keep that their, their main focus and understanding that that is what we're selling is that customer experience and how do we measure that. I'm Thank Paul you. Travis I'm with Avalara, and uh, the center of our conversation was about how what benchmark or metric actually reflects the level of, of culture or cultural accord. And so we were talking about a tool that um, Avalara uses, which is NPS, and then Lindsay was using, Ashley, sorry, I knew it was something there, um, was using Tiny Pulse as a way of kind of getting quick feedback. Um, it was interesting, you mentioned the data point of used to send out surveys the Tiny Pulse surveys by email and got a 30% uh, participation rate. And when they switched to a Slack integration, it went up to 60%. Uh, Mike Eustace with Tommy Bahama. And we were talking about um, basically how the entire co culture was so uh, siloed and people weren't talking. And uh, the biggest uh, challenge for us was to break down some of those walls and make sure that the entire company knew uh, what we were, what the goals were, uh, what we were marching towards. Uh, I think uh, the table uh, over in the corner said it well. Um, when you have everyone engaged, you're really looking at uh, an army of marketers. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're, you have that common goal, ours was mobile at the time, um, you know, you're going to break down some walls and create some understanding. Uh, I shared that uh, at the time, about two years ago, um, our mobile sales were about uh, 6%. Uh, daily, and uh, with that communication and with the sharing of uh, you know our goal to connect the guests and give them a better better experience, uh, the sales are around twenty seven percent for mobile. So, nice. just you know, communication uh, breaking down uh, interdepartmental uh, barriers and kind of creating an army of uh, marketers was our biggest. Uh, uh, Yep. Uh, growth opportunity recently. Thank you guys. So, thinking about this idea of 
culture and and how to reach across and some of you have mentioned like how do we how do we cross germinate what we're thinking about and history has a lesson about this I'm going to try to keep it quick because we're already running a little behind um, so thinking about history um, in what the 16th 16th century um, the everybody knows the Spanish America was being colonized the Spanish were coming in we had established missions right and the stated goal of, of that effort was to convert the indigenous people, right? To, con to convert their religion. And so to do this, they set up missions. And when they set up these missions, the expectation was that the indigenous people were going to come live on the mission, right? They were changing their whole way of life. Um, they brought, brought, you know, changed this focus to farming, animal husbandry, language, religion, even um, their underlying what did, we what, what did I say a minute ago? Assumptions and values, right? And it was especially, this was especially pronounced for the, the Pueblo Indians. They had a matrilineal system, a way of living, right? So you bring Christianity to, to, to a group of people like this, and it's like, what? <laughs> this doesn't even make sense. So in 1600, you can look it up online, the Acoma Uprising, there's a bunch of titles for it. Um, several hundred people were killed, and in that group of people were many of the priests, and they were thrown off cliffs. Right, um, because the culture, the stated, the stated goal to convert people, had turned into let's change their culture. Right? Guess, guess who gets thrown off the cliff in this in this story? Right? <laughs> so I didn't want my team to be thrown off cliffs. So I don't, we don't really have time to go into it here, but a huge part of culture is language, right? And in our organization, we were speaking this language of saving money and not spending too much money on on the customer. So, and I'd like to say this happened overnight. Um, it didn't, uh, but over time, we figured out that we needed, we needed analysts on our team. We're a UX team, right? Um, we, we hired analysts, and I'm not talking about ethnographers, I'm not talking about researchers, analysts. People who could run a SQL query and, and write a macro in Excel, um, people like that. And so I, we came to think of these as our translators, right? These were the people, and, and it was wonderful because they would go and they would talk to all the other number jockeys in the organization. Because as you know, if, you, if you're trying to do something that other people don't believe in, you, it's really hard to get data. It's really hard to get people to open up, up about what's really going on. So we hired translators. And then you have to feed the data machine, right? In our world, you have to feed the data machine. So we got busy trying to do our homework. Ultimately, we ended up visiting everyone and going everywhere, and I'll get a little bit into that. But one, of the, one of the most valuable things we did was we put customer feedback mechanisms everywhere. And I'm not talking about surveys. I mean open-ended, tell me what you think at every opportunity. And all of those words got turned into data. So we started feeding the data machine, and then we needed, we needed to talk to people, but people didn't trust us. Um, we, they thought we were, we were crazy. We were the Wild West. We were those weirdos over there in that office. What are they doing? There's stickies. Why are they standing up? I don't know. So, so we had to find a place where we could, like a spearhead, right? How do we get in? Well, we, were, we owned the website. We owned customer experience. So we started out by talking to the agents that belonged to us. These are our call agents, right? So we fly up to New York. These were the agents who answered all the questions. If the customer said website, transfer them to New York. So those were our agents that so we showed up. And it was crazy because even though those are the people that we technically kind of serve, they're the closest thing that we serve in the organization, still it was like the queen showing up. You stand there, you stand there. It was so controlled. Like, we, because they thought either they're here to automate our jobs away or they're going to report back what I'm doing wrong. Right? They came from corporate. Who knows what they want? So we, in, we, we came and we started by working on third shift. It's awesome, right? So we're on third shift, and what we found out totally by accident was by working third shift where we weren't bothering the agents, we could also interview customers. So it's slow. Customers on the phone, you know, having a problem. So we'd listen to the agent serve the customer, and then we'd interview the customer after the call. We'd have focus groups beforehand, and we'd have wrap-up after. And the whole thing turned into... And it, it was very unexpected, but what we discovered was the way we were treating customers, like nobody wants to treat a customer that way. It's, it's soul draining, right? And these people, even though they didn't trust because customer experience wasn't important, it was completely beat up in our organization, they wanted someone to talk to, so we kind of became like the camp counselors. We would tell people we would, leave, we would leave certificates behind. I helped improve. We left tchotchkes. We left emails. Hey, and my, my team's all Skype me, call me. You know, here's my mobile number. 
to establish the relationship of trust. We would leave, we'd send out emails to leaders, hey, first number one, we acknowledge the work you're doing is amazing and it's hard. Here's a few takeaways that we got. So gradually, over time, doors opened. We ended up, we ended up riding in trucks. I'm not even making this stuff up. We rode in trucks, right, Serve, along with technicians, you know, on not air-conditioned trucks. Air conditioning's a thing in Texas, right? Not so much here, I'm seeing, but um, we, we rode along with them. Um, we went to people's houses, seriously, we're crawling in their garage. And it's amazing, like, I don't even have to ask you, do you have kids? What's your demographic? Like, I can see I'm tripping over the bicycles in your garage, right? I know something about you. We climbed in their attics. We rode around with technicians. We saw the applications that they were using. So all of this documented, it went in with that customer feedback and we had these analysts working, working through this data. So here's the other thing that we found out. We would go to all these different places, right? And I'm, I'm using the extreme examples. We'd go over to finance, we'd go to legal, whatever. How often does legal come and visit customer care? <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> I mean, how often does IT do a ride along in a truck, right? And we found that we were starting to like be the company's ethnographers. We knew more about what was going on than just about anybody else. And it wasn't weird. Once the doors opened up, it wasn't weird that, that we were showing up going, so how do you do your job? And with that came, with that knowledge came power. And the more and more perspectives we got, the more we knew more than other people. Right? Unexpected. And so while that was going on, back at the ranch, I say, we're putting the data together and we're constantly checking. And here's another unexpected thing that happened. As we're checking, doing the, okay, well, the field told us they have this problem. We're talking to the DBAs. We're talking to the systems folks, to people in IT. We're having these conversations. And people, what do people love? People love to be heard. They love to talk. They know, love to know that their opinion has been taken into consideration, right? And before long, we had groups of people, right? And, and they're like, have you seen, what is that crazy group doing now? Blah, blah, blah. Oh, yeah, they told me. That's kind of cool, right? So the more we talked to people, the more we got buy-in about what it is we were doing, and we ended up getting more supporters. But one thing we learned while we were doing this because all of this came with, we had, we had to have a continuous stream of output, right? We're, we're building stories, we're building features. But as we're making our case, while a wall of post-its, the big ones too, look really awesome to me, other people don't necessarily think that that's awesome, right? <laughs> um, and a word bubble frequency chart might cut it for one person, but not for the other. So we were constantly having to communicate and recommunicate, and UX people love this, right? <laughs> we're having to change the way that we were communicating everything so that we were, we were making sure to communicate to everybody in their language. So, so that was another thing. I'm gonna run through an actual example really quick. So we'll, we'll talk a little bit about how the, how the rubber met the road, and that's not all that great. In the security world, you have a system, right, in your house. We, that's actually a keypad, but I won't get into the weeds on that. <laughs> difference between a system and a keypad. Um, and it's a little bit like a phone, right? ADT or whatever security, unless you have Nest or, or something like that, Simply Safe, they don't really know what you have. It's a little bit like a phone. So when you call us and you have a problem, I don't know, right? The thing is beeping. Oh, do you see a red button? We had agents who would just go, hit, hit the star. Just hit the star, right? We have no idea. And why is that bad? Well, it's bad because if the agent can't figure out what it is your system is and help you to fix the problem, then many things can happen. For one thing, we're gonna roll a truck. That's expensive, that's time consuming. You don't wanna wait on that truck. The worst thing that can happen is they'll tell you to change the battery on a system that you can't actually change the battery on and you just broke the whole system and now we're digging into your walls to replace it. So it can go badly. So we thought it would be awesome to provide customers with a, um, with a, with a system manual, and we could see through all of our data, we could see that there was this huge concentration of complaints around system, right? Well, system's pretty nebulous. What is, well, okay, well, people call to complain about their system. Well, that's what we do, we do systems, right? So not a lot of, we, we needed more information. So we sent, and I wish, I wish I was making this up, we went through three BAs, and, and we were like, we wanna fix this problem, and three BAs went, I'm out of here, right? Like, I, I don't have time for this. 
we did find out that there was 30,000 different systems in our database, right? There's not 30,000 different systems. If after 140 years, we have less than pristine data. It's, it's a mess. But by, by and large, the whole organization said, no, you can't do that. That won't work. So we got our own analysts to go in, and we actually had to look at the data, right? So we've got UX folks looking at data, yes. And we realized there is a way. We can do this. This is possible. We're not nuts. But they, the organization hated it, and this was another thing, right? And we, I think everybody in this room probably knows this. People, sometimes complexity is a little bit of a security blanket, right? Complexity gives me, give, gives me job security. It makes me a SME. It makes me special. It makes what we're doing really important. So they didn't like it, um, but we forged ahead, and we took the data that we had, and we actually went into, we, we took what we already know, and we actually went into call centers, and we timed. How long does it take an agent to try to figure out your system? right? It's like a five minute conversation, right? And then what happens when I get it wrong? And we're, we're sending a truck and, and we measured all of that and we realized, and so we, we came up with a business case, right? So some of you may be thinking that's not what we do, like that's somebody else's job. Um, in, in full disclosure, I had the pleasure um, of having both product owners and UX folks on my team. So it was always World War III in my office, but I did have more control than, um, than normal. Um, and the hardest part of being a product owner is meaning, prioritizing in a meaningful way. And what our UX folks discovered was that the more legwork they did on their own, the more they put the numbers together, the more likely our product owners were to prioritize them, right? Bring a product owner numbers, give them a reason to prioritize you, just give them something, something more than, wouldn't it be great if we had a button on the page with the, yeah. Bring them numbers and they will love you and you will get prioritized. So we constructed a business case. We actually did do this, but we made compromises along the way to adjust for the culture. Um, and at ADT, uh, this, this ran the line of, it, it, I know a lot of you work at amazing companies, but it, and maybe in healthcare, but at ADT it was always, that is a life safety issue. You are risking lives. And, and, and so that was the kind of the argument that we started getting about this. If you identify the system wrong, but we did make some compromises and we were able to get, get it out the door. Along the way, just a few more thoughts on this. Along the way, we realized if we were going to identify systems, we were gonna to have to draw pictures of them. We had pictures, they were out of manuals, they were terrible. So we set about drawing the images. Well, what we found out was that when we were drawing the images, guess who else can use them? Training can use them, marketing, media, all these other teams. And now they don't even know really what we're trying to do, but they're on board with that system normalization project. Yeah, that's cool. Everybody's like, no, it's horrible. No, this is cool. We're going to get images, right? We also created a customer feedback loop where customers could tell us when we had identified their system wrong. Now the data people love us. The data warehouse people love us. You're cleaning our data. It's wonderful. Customers can tell us that, that, that it's wrong. And then our internal people can say it's wrong too. People in the field. So now we have a whole army of people who are, I think somebody said army earlier, that are behind us. And they're not, they're not necessarily stakeholders. They're purely supporters, right? All of this is to say that by, by trying to speak the language of our organization, by understanding, fundamentally understanding, and if, if we go back to Edgar Schein, he says that it's hardest to understand a corporate culture when you're actually in it. It's hard to see it. But by understanding it and by working with it and learning to, figuring out how to speak the language of it, we weren't going to change the fact of how, how, the, how the indigenous people lived, but we could work with it. And as a result, and this is, this is all true, we built a record number of features. We brought hundreds and hundreds of features to our users. Um, we did finally end up emailing people and proactively notifying them of things, and I did get them to change their billing frequency. Um, we saved literally hundreds of millions of dollars. And we got our seat at the table, we increased our budget, right? But more important than that, we figured out how to use that seat at the table um, by learning, figuring out how to work within our culture. Hi, my name is Wendy Casey. I'm a product manager at T-Mobile. And I'm curious about what methods you found most effective for managing that feedback loop. So as you're gathering, you said you had lots and lots of touch points. And I'm curious, how did Games. you uncover themes and analyze what you were hearing? Right. Um, that's a great question. And we didn't, we started off very, it, it was ugly. It was ugly. 
Um, because that kind of feedback, and, and, I'll, and I'll go ahead and say this, we started off having the feedback, there was, there was data, um, it, it came back out of a system, right? And the, the way it came to us was in spreadsheets, it was dated, their IP address, the feedback, blah, blah, blah. And we ended up figuring out that that was actually really helpful, so as we would interview, um, as even if it was a casual conversation, or remember I said we would say Skype me or call me or email me, we figured out that that was the best way to keep track of everything. I know it's crazy, right? Like you, we, UX people in spreadsheets. But we would send it to the analyst and eventually we got to this place where everything was going into the spreadsheets. And um, I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm, not, I'm not here to advertise BI tools, but we, did, we didn't use BI tools. Um, and there's some amazing tools out there. We started out just going, well, can we do like a Wordle? Like, you know, the, the word cloud thing. And then that turned into, well, let's graph it. Okay, well, let's remove the, let's remove the stop words. Can we turn this into bar charts? And then, and then digging deeper and looking at trends. And so, and I'm not a data person, <laughs> but we had some amazing people who took the data, who basically we took and analyzed the verbiage. And then, and over time, we identified, like I'll give you an example. We figured out that it took an agent X number of minutes to solve a billing problem, and it took them X number of minutes to solve a system problem. And we were able to assign a cost to that. Right? It sounds very like, well, that's not UX, that's no fun. But it gave us the, the momentum and, and, and a way to speak about, well, no, this system stuff is really important. Did you know that for every two calls we spend $2, like, and people are, oh, they're paying attention, right? And it also helped us to know that, okay, even though the billing issues tend to be the loudest, they're not necessarily the ones that are causing the most customer angst, because I can see that, right? So it was, it was data analysis. Hi, my name is Kim Flannery Rye with Yesler. Um, one of the questions I had about culture is such, a, it's such an important aspect with our organization. And um, one of the things that we talk about when you're at a macro level, there's obviously you have your general sense of organization that you're talking about at ADT. And then really the culture is impacted at a micro level at every management position because you have your own sort of like your own, um, be like Seattle, within Seattle we have Capitol Hill that has a slightly different flavor than Fremont, but we're, we are all Seattle culture. Mm -hmm. So with you there in a fairly, di I mean very different, like you could have been a New York City burb or something like that that's in Seattle yeah. in ADT, um, but obviously those kind of impacts that you are having how did that ultimately affect the macro level of ADT's culture in right. the years that you've been there now? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. This presentation is actually longer. <laughs> I went ahead and stopped. Um, I, I will go ahead and tell you. So it did, it changed the conversation, I would say up to about a mid-level, right? We were able, and it is, it's, it's an amazing story, and that's why I volunteered to tell it. We were able to actually make a change up to a certain level where when I started at ADT, um, I would play this game. This is more than you guys probably should know. I would play this game um, in my first year there, and I would wait until everybody was done talking, and I would go, so how's it going to look to the customer? And the room would go silent. Like People would what is she babbling about and who hired that person? And, and that's, how it, that's how deep it ran. Um, and then by, you know, six years later, truly having a conversation, at least at the, the mid-level, like, okay, well, what's, how's that going to, you know, not deeply changing it. We still, we still want to make sure we spend less on them. But, but at least being able to have the conversation. Um, ultimately, ADT, and, and I'll just go ahead and tell this real quick, ultimately ADT was acquired in 2016, and that's why I was using that, that year as my, my focal point. And the new leadership, when we think about culture, the new leadership at ADT came in and decided that customer experience was number one. That was what we cared about. And so the conversation did change. Um, the, the behavior did change, but it took it being absolutely at our CEO level and everybody got new measurements. We were measured and, and they, they got true measurements that we, we had to pick up the phone in 60 seconds. Before they came along, the longest hold time on record was over four hours. Happened in the middle of the night and, a, and that's four hours and talked to an agent. 
somebody was really desperate. People would wait weeks for a truck roll. New leadership said a customer shall not wait more than 24 hours. Um, I was actually in a truck when we showed up at the house and the customer was still on the phone with the agent. And the customer looked at us and goes, this is like some Jimmy John shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> it was great. <laughs> So the conversation, it did change, but it took that level of leadership and that level of, of you know, pushing down. Uh, so Ashley Howard from Tableau. Um, you talked a little bit earlier about how you hired analysts, um, people who could write SQL queries for you, as well as the impact of data. Um, did you guys leverage other data that already exists in the organization, or did you build new mechanisms for bringing in data? We did, we were very, um, when I first started at ADT, we didn't have a data warehouse of any kind. Um, data was very, whoever can pull the best data wins. Um, and so that did change over the years. Um, and, and so part of, it, it's a great question, part of our reaction in, in, of hiring our own analysts was that it was really hard to get data. And then once we had the analysts, it was hard to get access. You probably all know, right? You don't just show up in IT and go, hey, I'd like the mainframe. And it doesn't work like that. So, um, and we, but we did also establish our own, like we, whatever what the, the um, like our, our marketing department was using a, a, a data gathering tool. And we changed that because it just didn't fit our needs. So we did put some of our own mechanisms in place. But, but we really had to start from scratch. Like our analysts had to go and get access to 10 different systems and you know, concatenate the data together and it, it was ugly. Over the years it changed, we do actually, ADT does have a data warehouse. And if my friends in that department see this, like I called you out. <laughs>